Good morning. Is that better? Welcome. I'm so glad that you're here this morning to come worship our Lord and Savior at St. Paul. Happy Fourth of July. I pray that today is a day that you can remember not only freedom of a nation, but more importantly, our freedom in Christ. That we are free to come to worship and to praise our awesome God in a country that affords us the opportunity to do that. Today, on the Lord's Day, there are people around the world who don't have that very freedom. Freedom in Christ is what we celebrate today. Yes, today is our first day, July the 4th, that we, following CDC guidelines and all of the other instructions from all the other entities, no longer, if you've been vaccinated, have to wear a mask. However, if you want to wear a mask, if that's what's best for you, your family, we support that 100%. We're just glad to come together today to come and worship and to praise the Lord. Today, today, you will hear, my grace is sufficient for you. Hmm. In our Old Testament, we get to hear about the prophet when Jesus told them, I've given you everything to say. I'm going to be with you. Paul, he says, Paul, don't worry about the thorn in your flesh because my grace is sufficient for you. So today, let's come before the Lord to celebrate the grace of God and his very goodness for you and for me. I invite you to stand. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. John chapter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Basically, you know what? If you say you're not sinful, you're just a big, fat liar. Because the truth is, we sin in ways that we're not even aware of. There are those things that keep us awake at night. There are those things that we plan, that we know have evil intent. There are those actions and things that we do and the manifestation of our sin. And yes, we are guilty. There's also the things that God calls us to do that we left undone. And things that we do we're not even aware. So before the Lord, and only in Him, we come to confess our sins. Let's come to the cross of Christ and confess our sins. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done, by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Yes. 
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you graciously use prophets and apostles to call your people to repentance. Grant us strength of faith in our day to announce your gracious love in Christ, that many repent and join us to celebrate your infinite mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 
I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hand on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching, and he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, Shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace I bring you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Have you ever known someone who was puffed up with pride? Know anybody like that? Someone with a really big ego? Someone who is an eye specialist? And I don't mean this kind of eye specialist. The one, I see some people laughing. The same kind of person who the I and the me are really, really close together in all they do and all they say. When Woodrow Wilson was the governor of New Jersey, a very ambitious young civil servant called him and woke him at 3.30 in the morning. Now get that. The nerve of a junior civil servant calling and waking the governor at 3.30 in the morning. And he did so. And he said simply, Mr. Governor, I am really, really sorry to wake you, but your state auditor has just died. And I would like to know if I can take his place. Think about that. True story. The nerve of somebody to do something like that. Well, Mr. Wilson thought over for a moment, then he replied real, real dryly. He said, well, I guess it's all right with me if it's all right with the undertaker. I wonder if that young civil servant really ever got the joke. People with a puffed up sense of pride rarely do. It's difficult sometimes to put up with people that have that kind of eye trouble, isn't it? Contrast that with a quote from the book cover of actress Katherine Hepburn's autobiography. You know, when people write books on the back cover, usually the publisher likes to say, look at who this person is, look at what this person's done, and lay out a litany of their accomplishments, how well published they are, and all just to build credibility so that you will read that book. And Katherine Hepburn, we know for over 60 years, was like the queen, like the elite of the elite in the showbiz industry. On the back of her cover was a very simple, humble message that said, Katherine Hepburn is an actress. She is interested in tennis and gardening and lives in a small town in Connecticut. This is her first book. Nothing else needed to be said for Katherine Hepburn. She didn't have the credentials boasted about her on the back of her cover. The late Marvin Hamlish was like that too. A very gifted composer. You know who that is, right? He is the one who wrote scores like uh, the theme for the movie The Sting. He also wrote The Way We Were and more and more. He was a child prodigy. At the age of seven, he was admitted into the school of Juilliard for music. A very gifted individual. Years later in his life, he was asked a question by a reporter who gushed and said, did you actually go to Juilliard at 7? To which he replied, yeah, but I didn't open the doors until 9 a.m. <laughs> That's a nice response, isn't it? No wonder the Bible lifts up humility as one of the cardinal virtues and puts down pride as one of the deadly sins. I guess sometimes we have to know the difference. How can you see the difference in your life? Sometimes it might be that we have to put on some chicken goggles. Let me explain. There was a psychologist who once did an experiment in where he put these eyeglasses on chicken. And I want you to know at the early service, somebody brought me a pair of these very spectacles to show me. Yes, it's true. He put it on them. Eyeglasses on chickens. Yeah, you got it. You heard me right. These glasses would cause the chickens to see a kernel of corn about one centimeter over from where it actually appeared. And what he was trying to do is to see when the chicken would peck at the corn, it always missed because the eyeglasses adjusted where the kernel of corn actually was. And the point of this experiment was to find out whether chickens are smart enough to adjust to their new glasses. And guess what? They're not. <laughs> Pride... And ego are just like those eyeglasses. They cause us to see things askew. And we're like the dumb chickens who just can't learn to see straight to compensate for the distortion. You see, St. Paul was concerned about the temptation to pride. Not so much in others as he was in himself. After all, he was a man given to visions and given to revelations. It gave him insights into the mind of God that few people at that time ever had a chance to experience. 
He was a man with great influence in the New Testament, and he was a man that had very lofty, affluent intellect. After all, he was trained by Gamaliel, who was like the man. He was the rabbi. If you were going to be in the elite class, you needed to be trained by Gamaliel, and Paul was. No one, no one in the church we read about was as educated as Paul was. In other words, see, he was a Harvard man in the company of rednecks. I can relate to that being from Tennessee. At least 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament were attributed to Paul in his writings. And they, they too, have been attributed half of what happens in the book of Acts and the Acts of the Apostles to Paul's life. He had their credentials. And they've been really easy, very easy for Paul to become arrogant or to become proud or to think more of himself than he should. For even church leaders can be afflicted with the deadly sin of pride. You see, except for one thing. In Paul's case, he had decided that he understood that he had a weakness. And we don't know what that weakness was. Scholars have argued about that for a long, long time. But he had something in his life that was a continual reminder to him of his humanity and of his limitations. Paul called it his thorn in the flesh. We read about it in our lesson in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. In order to keep me from becoming conceited. In other words, Paul didn't want to be a chicken with eyeglasses. He didn't want his perspective to be skewed by his pride. I was given a thorn in the flesh, he said. That's a wonderful suggestive phrase. A thorn, think about it, in the flesh. Can you imagine a very large splinter in your body somewhere that you couldn't take out, the doctor couldn't remove, that was causing excruciating pain, that kept getting caught on like the door as you walked through, or kept getting twigged on the sweater when you put it, well forget that, you don't wear sweaters down here, kept getting twigged on your clothing when you put it on. Talk about something that was a painful reminder continually about a thorn in the flesh. All you can do is learn to live with it. We don't know what his thorn was. Some said it was an incessant temptation. Others suggest that it's a chronic malady that he had that came from being blinded in his revision. Maybe he couldn't see real well, or maybe he was grotesque in his appearance, or maybe he had a speech issue that he didn't speak real well. Or migraine headaches may be caused from his being blind and then restored sight. We don't know what it was, but here is the amazing thing. Whatever this thorn was, Paul considered it to be a gift. For me, simply put, in the last 15 months, the mask has been a thorn in the flesh. I don't know about you, this pandemic has been a thorn in the flesh. Can't see people, or hug people, or tell people without half of your face being removed it, and yet it's a gift think about that Paul it was a gift that he would never forget the one thing most important to him because of his thorn in the flesh he wouldn't forget who he was and who God is and that would forever help him remain humble in Paul's estimation God gave him this thorn a constant reminder of his weakness that he might continually be reminded of his dependence on God and God alone. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a thorn in your flesh? Do you have a constant irritant that you may never get rid of? And don't you dare point to your spouse. I'm watching you. <laughs> Terry, you're laughing way too loud. Maybe you're... <laughs> Maybe your uh, thorn in the flesh is a physical disability you were born with. Or maybe it's something you've developed over time. Maybe it's chronic pain. Maybe it's a disease. Maybe it's a broken relationship. All of us have different thorns. Is there any way that you could embrace that thorn as a gift from God? <laughs> embrace it as a gift. I don't mean that God actually sent you that thorn. God doesn't work that way. 
Nevertheless, God is there as you deal with that thorn, and God can use that thorn to bless your life, and through that can bless others, just as Paul's thorn served as a positive part of his life. There have been people with terminal illnesses who have embraced their thorn and said, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me because I discovered how much people love me and how much my God loves me. Many of you know the story about my brother, my older brother Mike, who died of cancer at the age of 39. Near the end of Mike's life, he battled terribly with pain, unbelievable pain. And God, through his grace and mercy, allowed my brother to be paralyzed, at least from his waist down, which brought some relief. But his pain, his pain was something that he had to endure till the day he took his last breath. And through that last few months, my wife and I talked. My brother loved art. He would have loved to travel the world to see art. And we said, Mike, if there's anywhere you can go, anywhere, we'll pay for it. We'll take you there. We'll push you in a wheelchair. Whatever it is, just tell us where you want to go. What part of the world that you want to see? And I'll never forget his response was, Scott, I don't believe God is allowing me to go through this cancer so I can experience the world. Rather, I believe he's allowing me to go through this cancer so the world can experience him in me. <laughs> Embracing that gift, even the thorn in the flesh can be a gift if you offer it up to God. If you go to God in prayer if you constantly are in prayer to God about your thorn. Prayer has got to be important in this process as we embrace the thorn. As Paul writes, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. It's understandable that Paul would pray that God would take away his thorn. He would have been considered that affliction, an obstruction to a wider, more opportunity because he was proclaiming the message of God. And if he could take the thorn away, it'd be absurd for him not to do that, not to have prayed to be relieved of that. But Paul learned a very important lesson, the same lesson for you and for me, that during this time of prayer and petitioning, God's power is what he needed. God's grace is sufficient for him, now with his thorn and for always. You see... More than changing our circumstance, prayer is meant to change us, not the circumstance. Paul undoubtedly prayed not only to be delivered from the thorn of the flesh, but also for the ability to learn and to grow because of his thorn, to change him. Paul learned from his experience, and that is the sufficiency of God is enough. Three times, he said, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Paul said of that thorn in the flesh, but God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Your weakness, my weakness, your affliction is an opportunity for God to demonstrate his power in our life. Don't despise your thorn. Hold it up as a trophy of God's sufficient grace in your life and his work in your life. What a beautiful witness that is, and it would be if God's power in you, shining through you, in the midst of your sickness, in the midst of your pain, and all kinds of hurt and anxiety, that you still are able to maintain the ability to praise God. Amen? Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake... I delight in my weakness and insults and hardship and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God's grace transformed Paul's perspective. Things like weakness, insults from his critics, hardships and persecution, which would naturally elicit worry, depression, contempt, or even vengeance. And he can now welcome supernaturally all of those to his life by God's grace. So I ask you, do you have a thorn in your flesh? 
Remain humble. See, if you can welcome that thorn as an opportunity for God to demonstrate his power in your life, trust God's grace and his mercy to carry you through all of life's situations. And when you pray, when you pray for that deliverance, be open to his sovereignty to change you, even if he doesn't change your circumstance. Therefore, Paul writes, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Now may the power of our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve in you true faith for your daily task and for life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to stand as we come together to confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Please be seated. This week we have a few prayer requests to bring before you. One, Rainy Guptar asks for prayers for her family as her mother, Sita, had passed away this week. She had battled Alzheimer's for over 16 years and was called to her eternal rest. Also, for Elaine Sabina, a friend of Kevin Rebecca Raw, who is missing at the Surfside tragedy. Also, we've continued our prayers for Andrea Brown, who broke her hip and pelvis and uh, is in a lot of pain and still trying to work through her recovery. For Jose Munoz for kidney health. And also, for um, we pray for thanks along with the Benami family for the birth of, is it Kaya? Kaya Grace. And then Chris Pasco this morning asked for prayers to the family of Mary Kotulak, which is her cousin who passed away this morning. Let's come before the Lord with our prayers. Let us pray for the whole people of God and for all people according to their needs. Almighty and most holy God, we thank and praise you for all you provide us freely by your grace. We are especially thankful for the freedoms we enjoy and celebrate today as we gather to worship you. Lord, in your mercy, Amid the thorns of life, we lean on your grace, Father, knowing that it is sufficient for us in our weakness, and in that your strength shines through. We ask for your grace and healing for those who grieve. We ask for your grace and healing for those who struggle in mind, body, and spirit. Lord, in your mercy, we live in a nation and in communities where we are thankful to have brothers and sisters in Christ. Yet there are so many who have either disconnected from you and your church or have never known you. Lead us to share your grace with others. Guide our conversations and grow our relationships with those who do not share the hope we have. Lord, in your mercy, no matter where life takes us, Lord, we know we are in your hands. So we confidently come before you as your children and place these prayers and all our concerns into your gracious hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we come before the Lord, we come to gather our gifts. If you are here on campus in worship today, as you exit any of the doors or offering plates for you to leave your tithe and your offering, if you join us online, we want to say thank you for being here. On your screen appears a QR code. You can take your smartphone or smart device, open up your camera and scan that. It'll take you directly to our online giving platform where you can continue in your tithe and your stewardship and your offering. Let's come before the Lord and thank him for the gifts that he has given to us. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of heaven and earth. Day by day you shower us with blessings. As you have raised us to new life in Christ, give us glad and generous hearts, ready to praise you and to offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. As we come before the Lord to continue 
and receive his very body and blood and the gifts that he brings to us in this Lord's Supper. If you are a baptized brother and sister in Christ and you believe that in, with, and under this bread and this wine are his true body and blood, and that in receiving you know that you've received the very forgiveness of sins as you come with a penitent and contrite heart before the Lord, and with the help of the Holy Spirit you will change your life, I invite you to come, to come and receive this very meal of Christ. If you still have questions about that, would like to discuss that more, I still encourage you to come forward. Just cross your hands upon your heart and receive a blessing of the Lord. I invite you to stand for the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right and salutary, that we should at all times and all places give thanks and praise to your holy name, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us eternal life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray the prayer he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. It was on that night when our Lord was betrayed that he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he blessed it and he gave it to him saying, drink of it all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. The true body of Christ has been broken for you.
given for you take eat the true body of our Lord given just for you take eat the true body of Christ broken just for you Maddie take eat the true body of Christ given for you take eat the true body of Christ given just for you true body of Christ broken for you. Take eat the true body of our Lord broken just for you. Bruce can take eat the true body of Christ given just for you.
Christ given just for you. I invite you to stand. Now may this body and blood of our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve in you true faith for your daily task and for life everlasting to depart in peace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Just one announcement. One is that if you are a visitor here this morning, we want to say thank you for being here, and I hope this weekend you enjoy your time of celebration, and I pray today you enjoyed your celebration of our Lord and our Savior. I ask if you are a visitor, as you leave today, we have a special gift for you. One is a book called God's Bible Promises, simply just topical words. Each page has two or three scripture verses to encourage you, to help you, and for you to enjoy in your walk. Also, we have a cup. One side has the St. Paul logo, and the other side has the word coffee. However, it stands for something, C-O-F-F-E-E. -E. Christ offers forgiveness for everyone everywhere. So take one of those with you. If you are a member of St. Paul and you know of someone who might enjoy the Bible promises, please take one of those as you leave today and share the good news of Jesus Christ with someone. So today, free? Yeah. As we've heard, free, free at last, we celebrate first and foremost, not our freedom as a nation, our freedom in Christ, amen? amen? And because his grace is sufficient for us, we praise the Lord that we live in a nation that's free. Enjoy your celebration of your Lord this holiday. And as you go, may God bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Jesus.
Jesus, lead the Guide us by thy hand to our fatherland. If the way be drear, if the foe be near, let not faithless fear overtake us, let the throne of hope forsake us. For through many a woe to our home we go. When we seek relief from a long felt grief, when we tation come alluring, make us patient and enduring. Show us that bright shore where we weep no more. Jesus, lead thou on till our rest is won. Heavenly leader, still defend a poor console protect us. Till we safely stand in our Father. Lord Jesus, you lead us. Now we go as go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. Hey, good to see you. How you been? Good, good. Oh, yeah, gee, thank you. <laughs> Blessings to you. Enjoy the day. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to send an email out. Uh...